So, you know, the rationale for this, um, for this study is to look at the patients who developed non-response to pembrolizumab on the Keynote 57 trial. And as you know, the Keynote 57 trial read out as a positive trial um, warranting FDA approval for pembrolizumab in the BCG unresponsive setting. But nevertheless, uh, there's only 20% of the patients who were able to maintain their complete response by the 12-month mark. And so the vast majority of the patients did develop, uh, you know, disease recurrence after a certain time period. The question that we wanted to ask is, is it possible for us to continue a bladder sparing therapeutic strategy in this disease setting, even after non-response to PEMBA, um, rather than taking them for a radical cystectomy? So the way that we did that was we observed there are three different groups um, within the Keno 57 cohort. Uh, there's the patients who developed non-response and went directly to radical cystectomy within a four-month time period. There are those who were initially treated with bladder sparing therapy and then went on to radical cystectomy beyond four months. And then there are those patients who never went on to radical cystectomy and were treated with bladder sparing therapy alone. So within these three different cohorts, we asked whether there is any difference between them in terms of progression-free survival to muscle invasive disease or metastasis whether there's any difference in metastasis-free survival and also overall survival. And in a nutshell, we found that there wasn't any difference between the three different treatment strategies. And I think that has very important implications in that if the patients were to, um, say, not respond to the first line of salvage therapy after BCG unresponsiveness, they still have a window of opportunity to be treated, continued on bladder sparing therapy, so that we do not necessarily have to re surgically remove their bladder and subject them to all of the complications and the morbidities that are associated with the surgery. There really wasn't any differences in terms of the pathologic staging of patients who underwent radical cystectomy up front versus those that had delayed radical cystectomy. I should qualify by saying that um, we did exclude those patients who underwent radical cystectomy up front, who were found to have muscle invasive disease, because those patients, you know, again, they, um, they were understaged essentially at the time of the disease non-response. Um, so, but comparing those patients who had uh, uh, radical cystectomy up front versus the delayed radical cystectomies, uh, the pathologic um, staging was relatively similar, again, speaking to the fact that you can wait for a certain time period before moving on to radical cystectomy without really losing this window of curability. You know, I think we're learning a lot about this disease space, BCG unresponsive carcinoma in situ, and also BCG unresponsive papillary-only disease. It used to be that we're very, um, we, we were very concerned about disease progression if the patients were to recur with disease. More and more, I feel like w once we followed out these patients through clinical trials in a very rigorous and regimented follow-up protocol, we can detect cancer recurrence. And now we're understanding that we can continue to treat these patients without risking them progressing onto muscle invasion or metastatic disease. So what this implies is that we can continue to treat these patients in the bladder sparing manner and with many more bladder sparing therapies coming online and being approved by the FDA, you know, it's really going to be up to us to figure out which therapy we should use up front, followed by which therapies and which, which therapies should be paired with which that makes the most sense.